Welcome to Lovely Antique Ladies. Here, I share old-time recipes, cooking tips, advice, and poetry from ladies from the early 1900s. If you love cooking or enjoy classic wisdom, join me for a charming journey back in time. Subscribe now and let's explore the past together. Ladies' Book of Etiquette by Florence Hartley Chapter 1 Conversation The art of conversation consists in the exercise of two fine qualities. You must originate, and you must sympathize. You must possess at the same time the habit of communicating and of listening attentively. The union is rare but irresistible. None but an excessively ill-bred person will allow her attention to wander from the person with whom she is conversing. And especially she will never, while seeming to be entirely attentive to her companion, answer a remark or question made to another person, in another group. Unless the conversation be general among a party of friends, confine your remarks and attention entirely to the person with whom you are conversing. Steele says, I would establish but one great general rule in conversation, which is this that people should not talk to please themselves, but those who hear them. This would make them consider whether what they speak be worth hearing, whether there be either wit or sense in what they are about to say, and whether it be adapted to the time when, the place where, and the person to whom, it is spoken. Be careful in conversation to avoid topics which may be supposed to have any direct reference to events or circumstances which may be painful for your companion to hear discussed. You may unintentionally start a subject which annoys or troubles the friend with whom you may be conversing. In that case, do not stop abruptly when you perceive that it causes pain and, above all, do not make the matter worse by apologizing. Turn to another subject as soon as possible and pay no attention to the agitation your unfortunate remark may have excited. Many persons will, for the sake of appearing witty or smart, wound the feelings of another deeply. Avoid this. It is not only ill-bred, but cruel. Remember that having all the talk sustained by one person is not conversation. Do not engross all the attention yourself by refusing to allow another person an opportunity to speak and also avoid the other extreme of total silence or answering only in monosyllables. If your companion relates an incident or tells a story, be very careful not to interrupt her by questions, even if you do not clearly understand her. Wait until she has finished her relation and then ask any questions you may desire. There is nothing more annoying than to be so interrupted. I have heard a story told to an impertinent listener which ran in this way. I saw a fearful sight. When? I was about to tell you, last Monday, on the train. What train? The train from B. We were near the bridge. What bridge? I will tell you all about it, if you will only let me speak. I was coming from B. Last Monday, did you say? And so on. The story was interrupted at every sentence, and the relator condemned as a most tedious storyteller when, had he been permitted to go forward, he would have made the incident interesting and short. Never interrupt anyone who is speaking, it is, it is very ill-bred. If you see that a person to whom you wish to speak is being addressed by another person, never speak until she has heard and replied. Until her conversation with that person is finished. No truly polite lady ever breaks in upon a conversation or interrupts another speaker. Never, in speaking to a married lady, inquire for her husband, or, if a gentleman, ask for his wife. The, the elegant way is to call the absent party by their name. Ask Mr. Smith now Mrs. Smith is, or inquire of Mrs. Jones for Mr. Jones, but never for your husband or your wife. On the other hand, if you are married, never speak of your husband as your lord, husband, or good, or good man. Avoid, also, unless amongst relatives, calling him by his Christian name. If you, if you wish others to respect him, show by speaking of him in respectful terms that you do so yourself. If either your own husband or your friends is in the army or navy, or can claim the doctor, professor, or any other prefix to his name, there is no impropriety in speaking of him as the colonel, doctor, or whatever his title may be. It is a mark of ill breeding to use French phrases or words, unless you are sure your companion is a French scholar, and, even then, it is best to avoid them. Above, above all, do not use any foreign word or phrase, unless you have the language perfectly at your command. I heard a lady once use a Spanish quotation. She had mastered that one sentence alone. But a Cuban gentleman, delighted to meet an American who could converse with him in his own tongue, immediately addressed her in Spanish. Embarrassed and ashamed, she was obliged to confess that her knowledge of the language was confined to one quotation. Never anticipate the point or joke of any anecdote told in your presence. If you, if you have heard the story before, it may be new to others, and the narrator should always be allowed to finish it in his own words. To take any sentence from the mouth of another person, before he has time to utter it, is the height of ill breeding. Avoid it carefully. Never use the phrases, what do you call it? Thingummy. What's his name? Or any such substitutes for a proper name or place. 
If you cannot recall the names you wish to use, it is better not to tell the story or incident connected with them. No lady of high breeding will ever use these substitutes in conversation. Be careful always to speak in a distinct, clear voice. At the same time avoid talking too loudly, there is a happy medium between mumbling and screaming. Strive to attain it. Overlook the deficiencies of others when conversing with them, as they may be the results of ignorance and impossible to correct. Never, never pain another person by correcting, before others, a word or phrase mispronounced or ungrammatically constructed. If your intimacy will allow it, speak of the fault upon another occasion, kindly and privately, or let it pass. Do not be continually watching for faults, that you may display your own superior wisdom in correcting them. Let modesty and kind feeling govern your conversation, as other rules of life. If, on the other hand, your companion uses words or expressions which you cannot understand, do not affect knowledge, or be ashamed of your ignorance, but frankly ask for an explanation. In conversing with professional gentlemen, never question them upon matters connected with their employment. An author, an author may communicate, voluntarily, information interesting to you upon the subject of his works, but any questions from you would be extremely rude. If you meet a physician who is attending a friend, you may inquire for their progress, but do not expect him to give you a detailed account of the disease and his manner of treating it. The same rule applies to questioning lawyers about their clients, artists on their paintings, merchants or mechanics of their several branches of business. Professional or businessmen, when with ladies, generally wish for miscellaneous subjects of conversation and, as their visits are for recreation, they will feel excessively annoyed if obliged to talk shop. Still many men can converse on no other subject than their everyday employment. In this case listen politely and show your interest. You will probably gain useful information in such conversation. Never question the veracity of any statement made in general conversation. If you, are, if you are certain a statement is false and it is injurious to another person who may be absent, you may quietly and courteously inform the speaker that he is mistaken, but if the falsehood is of no consequence, let it pass. If a statement appears monstrous, but you do not know that it is false, listen, but do not question its veracity. It may be true, though it strikes you as improbable. Never attempt to disparage an absent friend. It is, it is the height of meanness. If others admire her, and you do not, let them have their opinion in peace. You will probably fail if you try to lower her in their esteem, and gain for yourself the character of an ill-natured, envious person. In conversing with foreigners, if they speak slightingly of the manners of your country, do not retort rudely or resentfully. If their views are wrong, converse upon the subject, giving them frankly your views, but never retaliate by telling them that some custom of their own country is worse. A gentleman or lady of true refinement will always give your words candid consideration, and admit that an American may possibly know the customs of her country better than they do, and if your opponent is not well-bred, your rudeness will not improve his manners. Let the conversation upon national subjects be candid, and at the same time courteous, and leave him to think that the ladies in America are well-bred, however much he may dislike some little national peculiarity. Avoid, at all times, mentioning subjects or incidents that can in any way disgust your hearers. Many Many persons will enter into the details of sicknesses which should be mentioned only when absolutely necessary, or describe the most revolting scenes before a room full of people, or even at table. Others speak of vermin, noxious plants, or instances of uncleanliness. All such conversation or illusion is excessively ill-bred. It is not only annoying, but absolutely sickening to some, and a truly ladylike person will avoid all such topics. I cannot too severely censure the habit of using sentences which admit of a double meaning. It is not it is not only ill-bred, but indelicate, and no person of true refinement will ever do it. If you are so unfortunate as to converse with one who uses such phrases, never by word, look, or sign show that you understand any meaning beyond the plain, outspoken language. Avoid always any discussion upon religious topics, unless you are perfectly certain that your remarks cannot annoy or pain any one present. If you, if you are tea to tea with a friend, and such a discussion arise, inquire your companion's church and mention your own, that you may yourself avoid unpleasant remarks, and caution him. Never, when advancing an opinion, assert positively that a thing is so, but give your opinion as an opinion. Say, say, I think this is so, or these are my views, but remember that your companion may be better informed upon the subject under discussion, or, where it is a mere matter of taste or feeling, do not expect that all the world will feel exactly as you do. Never repeat to a person with whom you converse any unpleasant speech you may have heard concerning her. If you, if you can give her pleasure by the repetition of a delicate compliment or token of approval shown by a mutual friend, tell her the pleasant speech or incident, but do not hurt her feelings or involve her in a quarrel by the repetition of ill-natured remarks. Amongst well-bred persons, every conversation is considered in a measure confidential. 
A lady or gentleman tacitly confides in you when he, or she, tells you an incident which may cause trouble if repeated, and you violate a confidence as much in such a repetition as if you were bound over to secrecy. Remember this. Never criticize a companion's dress, or indeed make any remark whatever upon it. If a, ne if a near friend, you may, if sincere, admire any article, but with a mere acquaintance let it pass unnoticed. If, however, any accident has happened to the dress of which she is ignorant, tell her of it, and assist her in repairing the mischief. To be able to converse really well, you must read much, treasure in your memory the pearls of what you read. You must have a quick comprehension, observe passing events, and listen attentively whenever there is any opportunity of acquiring knowledge. A quick tact is necessary, too, in conversation. To converse with an entirely uneducated person upon literature, interlarding your remarks with quotations, is ill-bred. It places them in an awkward situation and does not add to your popularity. In conversing with persons of refinement and intelligence, do not endeavor to attract their admiration by pouring forth every item of your own information upon the subject under consideration, but listen as well as talk and modestly follow their lead. I do not mean to assent to any opinion they may advance if you really differ in your own tastes, but do not be too ready to show your superior judgment or information. Avoid argument, it is not conversation, and frequently leads to ill feeling. If you if you are unfortunately drawn into an argument, keep your temper under perfect control, and if you find your adversary is getting too warm, endeavor to introduce some other topic. Avoid carefully any allusion to the age or personal defects of your companion, or anyone who may be in the room, and be very careful in your language when speaking of a stranger to another person. I have heard a lady inquire of a gentleman who that frightful girl in blue could be, and receive the information that the lady in question was the gentleman's own sister. Be careful, when traveling, not to wound the feelings your friends in another country or city by underrating their native place or attempting to prove the superiority of your own home over theirs. Very, very young girls are apt to suppose, from what they observe in older ones, that there is some particular manner to be put on in talking to gentlemen and, not knowing exactly what it is, they are embarrassed and reserved. Others observe certain airs and looks used by their elders in this intercourse and try to imitate them as a necessary part of company behaviors and so become affected and lose that first of charms, simplicity, natural grace. To such let me say your companions are an error. It requires no peculiar manner, nothing to be put on, in order to converse with gentlemen any more than with ladies. And the more pure and elevated your sentiments are and the better cultivated your intellect is, the easier will you find it to converse pleasantly with all. One good rule can be always followed by young ladies. To converse with a lady friend as if there were gentlemen present, and to converse with a gentleman as if in the room with other ladies. Avoid affectation. It is the sure test of a deceitful, vulgar mind. The best cure is to try to have those virtues which you would affect, and then they will appear naturally, 